Hey guys, welcome back to Cyber Platter. Today we'll learn about identity and access management interview question and answers. This is part one. There'll be other parts which I will link it in the description bo box as and when I upload uh, the others. If you want to know about other cybersecurity topics or interview questions like related to EDR, SIM, uh, SOC or security engineering, vulnerability management, everything is in the description box or individual topics like uh, incident response that is also linked in the description box. Let's start with the first question. What is identity and access management, IAM, and why is it important for organizations? Identity and access management is a comprehensive framework and a set of technologies that organizations use to manage and secure digital identities, control access to resources, and ensure the right people have the right level of access to the right systems and data. IAM plays a critical role in safeguarding an organization's digital assets and data. Let's see some of the key reasons why it is important. First, security. IAM is essential for protecting an organization's sensitive data, systems, and applications. It ensures that only authorized users can access specific resources, reducing the risk of data breaches and unauthorized access. Next, compliance. Many industries and organizations are subject to regulations and data protection laws that require them to maintain strict control over who can access certain data. IAM helps organizations meet compliance requirements. Next, efficiency. IAM streamlines the process of granting and revoking access, making it easier for administrators to manage user accounts and access permissions. This efficiency also enhances productivity. Next, user experience. IAM solutions, for example, like a single sign-on that is SSO, enhance the user experience by reducing the need for multiple passwords and logins. Users can access various systems and applications with a single set of credentials. Next, cost reduction. IAM helps reduce operational costs by automating identity-related tasks, including onboarding and offboarding of employees, thereby reducing using administrative over overhead. Next, risk management. IAM systems provide detailed access control, monitoring and reporting, enabling organizations to detect and respond to security incidents and policy violations. Next, audit and accountability. IAM solutions offer audit and reporting capabilities, ensuring that organizations can track who accessed what resources, when and for what purpose. Next, centralized management. IAM centralizes identity and access control, simplifying the administration of user accounts and access rights across the organization. Next, adaptability. As organizations evolve, IAM allows for the dynamic adjustment of user access rights based on roles, responsibilities, and changing business needs. Next, remote workforce. With the rise of remote and mobile workforces, IAM is crucial for securely managing user identities and access from various locations and devices. So in summary, IAM is very important for protecting an organization's digital assets, ensuring compliance and improving operational efficiency and enhancing the overall security and productivity of the organization. It's a fundamental component of modern cybersecurity and data protection strategies. Let's go to the next question. What is the concept of IAAA in identity and access management? So there is a separate video which talks about IAAA in depth. I will attach that in the description box if you want more details. IA8 stands for identification, authentication, authorization, and accountability in identity and access management. First, identification. Identification is the process of recognizing and validating user's identity. It typically involves the use of a unique identifier such as a username, em employee ID, or email address to associate a user with their digital identity within an organization systems. A 
authentication. Authentication is the process of verifying the claimed identity of a user to ensure they are who they say they are. This is typically done by presenting one or more factors of authentication, such as something the user knows, example, password, something they have, example, security token, or something they are, example, biometric data. Next is authorization. Authorization follows authentication and is the process of determining what actions and resources an authenticated user is allowed to access. This is based on the user's role, permissions, and security policies. Next, accountability is the process of tracking and recording user actions and access events. This provides an audit trail to monitor who accessed what, when, and for what purpose. Accountability helps with compliance, security monitoring, and incident response. So let's look at all of these with an example. Suppose say there is a web application. A user is on the login page. A user enters their username on the login page to identify themselves to an application or system. This is identification. After entering a username, the user provides a password and the system validates that the password matches the stored credentials for that user. This is authentication. Once the user is authenticated, the system checks their authorization to determine if they have privileges to view, edit, or delete specific files or data. This is authorization. And in an IAM system, all access and authentication events are logged, allowing administrators to review and investigate any suspicious or unauthorized activities. That accounts for accountability. So the these four components work together to ensure that users are properly identified, authenticated, and granted appropriate level of access to resources. Accountability in turn provides a record of these activities to maintain security and compliance. Let's go to the next question. What is single sign-on and what are its advantages and disadvantages for users and organizations? So SSO is an authentication and access control mechanism that allows users to access multiple applications or services with a single set of credentials such as a username or password. Instead of requiring users to remember and enter separate user usernames and passwords for each application, SSO simplifies the login process by authenticating the user once and then granting access to all authorized resources. So, for example, if you open app A in the first tab and enter your login credentials, that is username and password, and then open app B in the next tab, app B will not ask you for username and password again. It will use the same thing if SSO is established between these two. Now, let's see some of the advantages for users because of uh, SSO. First is convenience. Users benefit from the convenience of accessing multiple applications with a single login, reducing the need to remember multiple sets of credentials. Next, improved productivity. SSO streamlines the login process, saving time and reducing user frustration associated with managing multiple passwords. Next, enhanced user experience. A seamless login experience with SSO can improve user satisfaction, making it easier for them to access resources and get work done. Next, reduced password fatigue. SSO helps reduce the burden of managing and remembering numerous passwords, which can lead to stronger password security for the user. Next, single logout. SSO often includes the ability to log out of multiple applications simultaneously enhancing security and ease of use. Now let's look at the advantages for organizations because of uh, SSO. First, enhanced security. SSO can improve security by enforcing strong authentication methods, centralized user access control, and simplifying user provisioning and
and deprovisioning. Next, streamlined user management. Organizations can efficiently manage user accounts, roles, and access permissions in a centralized manner, reducing administrative overhead. Next, compliance. SSO solutions often offer auditing and reporting capabilities, aiding in compliance with regulatory requirements by tracking user access and activities. Next, reduce support cost. With fewer password-related issues and account lockouts, organizations can lower the cost of IT support. Next, scalability. SSO systems are scalable and can accommodate new applications and services as an organization's needs grow. Now let's look at the disadvantages of SSO. First, security risks. If a user's single set of credentials is compromised, all associated accounts become vulnerable. Protecting the primary SSO account is critical. Next, integration challenges. Implementing SSO may require integration efforts with existing applications and systems, which can be complex and time-consuming. Next, dependency on SSO provider. Organizations become dependent on the SSO provider's ability and security measures. Downtime or security breaches can have widespread consequences. Next, user resistance. Some users may resist using SSO due to concerns about privacy or a lack of trust in the system. Next, Complexity. SSO solutions can be complex to configure and maintain, which may require specialized expertise. So these are the disadvantages of SSO. So in summary, single sign-on offers substantial benefits in terms of user convenience, productivity, and security for both users and organizations. However, it also comes with certain disadvantages such as potential security risks and implementation challenges that organizations need to address to maximize the benefits of SSO. Next question, what is the principle of least privilege and why is it a fundamental concept in IAM? Principle of least privilege is also referred to as principle of least authority or principle of minimum privilege. It is a fundamental concept in identity and access management and cybersecurity. It states that individuals or systems should be granted the minimum level of access or permissions required to perform their legitimate tasks or functions and no more. In other words, users should have the least privilege necessary to complete their work effectively and safely. Let's see why it is important. The primary reason for implementing the principle of least privilege is to enhance security. By limiting access rights to the bare minimum, the potential attack surface is reduced. If a user's account is compromised, the attacker will have limited access, minimizing the damage they can inflict. Next, limiting access helps organizations mitigate risks associated with insider threats, accidental breaches, or compromised accounts. Even if an authorized user's credentials are uh, stolen, the potential damage is minimized. Next, data protection. In cases where sensitive or confidential data is involved, adhering to the principle of least privilege ensures that only individuals with a legitimate need can access, modify, or delete such data, reducing the risk of data leaks or unauthorized alterations. Next, compliance. Many industry regulations and data protection laws, such as GDPR or HIPAA, require uh, organizations to implement the principle of least privilege as part of their security and privacy measures. Adherence to this principle can help organizations demonstrate compliance. Next, least impact in case of errors. In scenarios where users make mistakes, the principle of least privilege limits the potential impact. Users with minimal privileges are less likely to make changes that could disrupt critical systems or data. 
Next, user accountability. When users are given only the privileges they need, it's easier to hold them accountable for their actions. Audit logs and monitoring become more effective in tracking user activities. Next, least complexity. By restricting access to only what's necessary, organizations simplify access control policies and reduce the complexity of managing user rights. This makes it easier to enforce security measures. Next, reducing attack paths. With limited privileges, users are less likely to inadvertently create or expose vulnerabilities that attackers could exploit. So in practice, the implementation of principle of least privilege may involve assigning users to roles based on their job functions, defining permissions associated with those roles, and regularly reviewing and adjusting access rights. While this approach may require more initial effort in access control, it pays off in terms of improved security and risk reduction. It's a critical component of a well-defined IAM strategy. Let's go to the next question. Can you explain the difference between role-based access control, RBAC, and attribute-based access control, ABAC? RBAC and ABAC are both access control models used in identity and access management to manage user permissions and control access to resources. Actually, there's a different video which explains in depth about all these access control models like uh, mandatory access control, discretionary access control, RBAC, ABAC. I will link that as well in the description box. Now let's look at the differences between them. In role-based access control, like the name suggests, access is based on predefined roles that correspond to job functions. In attribute-based access control, access is based on the evaluation of attributes such as user characteristics, resource properties, and environmental conditions. In RBAC, roles are assigned to the users and each role has a set of associated permissions and access rights. In ABAC, policies define access control based on attribute values, relationships, and conditions. Policies are highly granular and dynamic. In RBAC, access control is relatively coarse-grained. That is, users with the same role have the same access rights. But in ABAC, access control is fine-grained and highly contextual. Access decisions can be tailored to specific attributes and conditions. RBAC is known for its simplicity and ease of management. It's often used when access requirements are well-defined and relatively static. ABAC offers flexibility and can adapt to complex and dynamic access scenarios. It's suitable for organizations with evolving access control needs. Next, RBAC is straight forward to understand and audit. ABAC can be more complex to design, implement, and audit due to the potential complexity of attribute-based uh, policies. Next, scalability may be an issue in RBAC when dealing with a large number of roles, whereas ABAC can handle complex access scenarios, making it suitable for large organizations with diverse access requirements. RBAC is widely used in environments with clearly defined job roles and a limited number of roles. ABAC is used in scenarios where contextual and attribute-based access control is necessary, such as healthcare, finance, or dynamic cloud environments. So in summary, RBAC is simpler and more role-centric approach, while ABAC provides greater flexibility, fine-grained control, and adaptability to dynamic access scenarios. The choice between RBAC and ABAC depends on an organization's specific access control needs and complexity of its environment. Many organizations may use a combination of both to achieve the desired level of access. Many organizations may use a combination of both to achieve the desired level of access control. Let's go to the next question. What is identity governance and administration? That is IGA, 
and how uh, does it relate to IAM? IGA is a specialized subset of identity and access management that focuses on governance, compliance, and life cycle management of digital identities and their associated access rights. IGA solutions help organizations manage user identities and access to resources while ensuring compliance with regulatory requirements and internal policies. Now let's look at how IGA relates to IAM. First, scope and focus. So IAM is a broader discipline that includes all aspects of managing user identities and controlling access to resources. It includes components such as authentication, authorization, provisioning and directory services. IGA on the other hand specifically focuses on the governance and administration of entities and access. It involves managing roles, permissions, certificate, certifications, access requests and the entire life cycle of user identities from onboarding to offboarding. Next, key functions and components. So IAM includes core components like authentication, access control and single sign-on. It deals with user access in a more operational and technical capacity. IGA includes functions such as access certification, entitlement management, policy enforcement and compliance reporting. It focuses on the business aspects of identity management and ensures that users have the appropriate access for their roles. Next compliance and audit. While IAM solutions include some compliance and auditing features, their primary role is to enable secure access. But IGA is specifically designed to address compliance and audit requirements. It provides tools for certifying and reviewing user access to ensure that access rights comply with organizational policies and external regulations. Next, lifecycle management. IAM systems handle user provisioning, deprovisioning and access management, but they may not have the same level of governance and oversight as IGA. IGA solutions emphasize the end-to-end -end life cycle management of user identities, which includes creating, updating, reviewing and deactivating user accounts and access rights in a controlled and audited manner. Next business centric iam often leans more toward technical aspects and is focused on facilitating secure and efficient access iga is business centric aiming to align identity management with business objectives role based access and compliance requirements next access review and certification. IAM may provide access review capabilities, but it might not offer the extensive access certification features found in IGM. Access certification is a critical feature of IGA, enabling periodic reviews of user access rights and allowing certifiers to attest to the appropriateness of access. So in summary, Identity governance and administration is a specialized branch of identity and access management that specifically addresses the governance, compliance and lifecycle management of user identities and their access rights. While IAM focuses on technical aspects of access control, IGA emphasizes business driven identity management, access reviews and compliance management, making it an essential component in organizations organizations where strict governance and regulatory compliance are paramount. Let's go to the next question. How do you ensure password security within an organization's identity and access management framework? Ensuring password security within an organization's identity and access management framework is crucial for safeguarding digital resources and protecting sensitive data. Let's see some of the best practices and strategies to enhance password security. First, implement password policies. That is, enforce complex 
password requirements including a combination of uppercase lowercase letters numbers and special characters and then set minimum and maximum password length requirements require users to change their passwords periodically also you can set to prevent the reuse of recent passwords next multi factor authentication mfa encourage or require the use of mfa for all users mfa adds an additional layer of security by requiring users to provide multiple forms of authentication next password expiry and rotation implement a policy for password expiration and rotation while passwords should be changed periodically ensure that rotation frequency frequency is balanced to prevent overly frequent changes which can lead to weaker passwords next password storage and hashing store password securely by using strong salted and hashed storage mechanisms never store plain text passwords next user education and awareness educate users about the importance of strong passwords and the risks associated with weak or easily guessable ones encourage users to create unique passwords for different services and not share their passwords next implement account lockout policies that temporarily lock user accounts after a certain number of unsuccessful login attempts this helps deter brute force attacks next ensure that password recovery and reset processes are secure and require identity verification avoid easily guessable security questions next continuously monitor login attempts and set up alerts for suspicious activity rapid detection of unauthorized access attempts is essential for preventing breaches next encourage users to use password managers to generate and securely store complex passwords password managers can also automate password changes next policy enforcement use iam systems to enforce password policies automatically configure systems to reject weak passwords that don't meet policy requirements next conduct security audits and penetration tests to identify weaknesses in password security framework and address vulnerabilities next security updates keep iam and password management systems up to date with security patches and updates to address known vulnerabilities next have a well defined incident response ir plan in place to respond to security incidents such as compromised passwords and then take appropriate actions promptly next authentication factors consider alternative authentication methods such as biometrics or smart cards to enhance security beyond traditional passwords next implement a zero trust security model that does not rely solely on passwords but continuously monitors and verifies access based on contextual information so by following these best practices organizations can significantly improve password security security with their identity and access management framework reducing the risk of unauthorized access and data breaches it's essential to balance security with usability to ensure that strong password policies do not hinder productivity let's go to the next question what are the security challenges associated with managing privileged accounts and how can they be mitigated so managing privileged accounts presents unique security challenges due to the elevated access and privileges these accounts possess privileged accounts such as administrative and super user accounts often have broad control over an organization systems and data making them prime targets for attackers now let's look at the security challenges associated with privileged accounts first abuse of privilege the misuse or abuse of privileged accounts can lead to unauthorized data access system changes or data breaches 
Next, credential theft. Privileged account credentials can be compromised through various means such as phishing, social engineering, or malware. Even within the organization, there's a risk of unauthorized personnel gaining access to privileged accounts. Privileged account credentials might be shared among users, making it difficult to track and control who is using them. Inadequate authentication methods like weak authentication for privileged accounts can make them vulnerable to brute force attacks. Without proper monitoring and auditing, it can be challenging to attribute actions taken with privileged accounts to specific individuals. That is lack of accountability. Now that we know the challenges, let's look at the mitigation strategies. First, implement least privilege. That is, follow the principle of least privilege to restrict access to privileged accounts to only what is necessary for specific tasks. Avoid granting excessive rights. Then, deploy a PAM, that is, Privileged Access Management Solution that enforces strict controls over who can access privileged accounts and provide session monitoring and uh, recording. Next, enforce multi-factor authentication for privileged account access to add an additional layer of security beyond passwords. Next, implement strong passwords policies for privileged accounts including complex and regularly rotated passwords then securely store and manage privileged account credentials using solutions like password vaults and encryption continuously monitor and record sessions of privileged account usage to detect and respond to suspicious or unauthorized activity then regularly review and recertify access rights for for privileged account Accounts, verifying that only authorized personnel have access. Next, isolate and segment network and systems to minimize lateral movement by potential attackers who gain access to a privileged account. Next, educate users on the risks of sharing credentials and on proper security practices. Next, Consider accountability, that is, establish a clear process for tracking and attributing actions taken with privileged accounts. Ensure that actions can be linked to specific individuals. Next, develop an incident response plan for addressing potential breaches or unauthorized access to privileged accounts. Next, continuously evaluate and update the security measures in place for privileged account management, staying vigilant against emerging threats. So mitigating the security challenges associated with privileged account management requires a combination of technology, policies, and user awareness. By implementing these strategies, organizations can significantly enhance the security of privileged accounts and reduce reduce the risk of security breaches and unauthorized access. Let's go to the next question. Can you explain the concept of just-in-time provisioning in identity and access management? So just-in-time provisioning is a concept in identity and access management that refers to the process of creating user accounts and granting access rights to resources precisely when they are needed and only for the required duration. Just-in-time access provisioning is often associated with a dynamic and on-demand approach to managing access, user access. Let's see some of the key concepts of just-in-time access. First, on-demand access creation. Just-in-time provisioning creates user accounts and access rights just-in-time in response to specific user requests or access needs. This is in contrast to traditional methods of creating accounts and access rights during user onboarding, whether they are immediately needed or not. Next, temporary and limited access. Just-in-time provisioning often involves the assignment of temporary or limited access rights. For example, a user may be granted access for a specific project or a predefined time frame after which their access is automatically revoked. Next, 
minimizing over privileged accounts so just in time provisioning reduces the risk of over privileged accounts users receive access only to the resources and data necessary for their tasks preventing excessive permissions that can lead to security vulnerabilities next improved security by minimizing the duration and scope of access rights just in time provisioning enhances security it limits the window of opportunity opportunity for attackers and reduces the potential damage for, damage from compromised accounts next integration with access requests just in time provisioning often works in conjunction with access request workflows users request access to specific resources and the provisioning process is triggered when the request is approved next just in time provisioning is typically automated and orchestrated workflow automation tools can ensure that access is granted revoked or modified according to predefined policies next policy based control policies define the conditions under which access is provisioned and revoked these policies can be based on user attributes roles business rules or other contextual information next just in time provisioning systems often provide audit trails and logging capabilities which are critical for monitoring and tracking access changes next integration with iam systems just in time provisioning is commonly integrated with broader identity and access management systems it interacts with user directories identity management and access control components to ensure a coherent iam framework next just in time provisioning helps organizations adhere to compliance and governance requirements by ensuring that access is granted in a controlled and documented manner so just in time provisioning is a valuable approach in modern iam as it aligns access control with the principle of least privilege promotes resource efficiency and enhances security it's particularly relevant in dynamic environments where users access needs change frequently and where strict controls are essential let's go to the next question what is the difference between user provisioning and deprovisioning and why both are important user provisioning and deprovisioning are essential processes in identity and access management that manage the life cycle of user accounts and their access to resources they have distinct purposes but both are crucial for ensuring efficient and secure access management first let's talk about user provisioning user provisioning is often referred to as onboarding it is the process of creating user accounts defining access rights and providing initial privileges to users when they join an organization during user provisioning administrators set up user accounts define user roles and permissions assign access to necessary resources and configure initial settings this process ensures that new employees employees have the access they need to perform their job responsibilities user provisioning is vital for maintaining productivity and efficiency in the organization without timely and accurate provisioning new employees might might face delays in accessing essential systems hindering their ability to work effectively proper user provisioning reduces the risk of security gaps and unauthorized access because it ensures that access is granted according to the principle of least privilege it also facilitates compliance by implementing access controls from the start now let's talk about deprovisioning user deprovisioning is also called as offboarding or account termination it is the process of revoking access rights disabling accounts and removing user privileges when employees leave an organization or no longer longer require access during user deprovisioning administrators revoke access permissions disable user accounts and ensure that users no longer have access to systems applications and data 
This process reduces the risk of former employees retaining access to sensitive information. User deprovisioning is crucial for security and data protection. Failing to deprovision accounts in a timely manner can lead to unauthorized access, data breaches, and compliance violations. Proper user deprovisioning enhances security by closing off access to former employees, reducing the risk of insider threats. It also helps organizations maintain control over their system and data, ensuring that only authorized personnel have access. Proper user deprovisioning can lead to cost savings as well by reducing the licensing and resource costs associated with unused accounts. So in summary, user provisioning and deprovisioning are complementary processes in identity and access management. User provisioning focuses on granting access to new users efficiently and securely, while user deprovisioning focuses on revoking access from departing or no longer eligible users to maintain security, data protection, and efficiency. Both processes are essential for maintaining a well-managed and secure IAM uh, environment. So just a note, deprovisioning you shouldn't consider only when a person leaves the organization. You should consider it even when somebody changes their roles. So that's it for today, guys. Please don't forget to like, subscribe and share our videos. That helps us a lot. I will see you in another video with more questions on identity and access management. It is a very huge topic. So there'll be many more uh, questions. Until then, take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.